Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, or Zechariah, let me see, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Got to get those, mm, you got to get a rhythm in there. You got to get a rhythm or you, you mess it up. Now, if, and if you got a Schofield, it's page 955. How's that? Amen. Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I, you know, after you do a message, you start kind of searching for a title. Um, I've preached in Habakkuk several times, but it's one of my favorite of the minor prophets. I've titled the message, A Perplexing Problem. Perplexing Problem. That's my favorite word to my wife when I just don't know which way to turn, which way to go, don't know what to think. She'll look and I'll, she'll say, are you perplexed? And I said, I sure am. That means I don't even know which way to go. Perplexing problem. Habakkuk had a perplexing problem. Habakkuk, Habakkuk had, a, had a difficulty understanding and justifying God's ways. I'm going to show you that right here in, in, in this little book. He was greatly perplexed and worried over the confused issues that were going on in the country. Now, I, for the life of me, I can't understand why people in our country do what they do. I don't understand why they, 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 they traded five terrorists for a bird dog. I, I, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand why there's an issue in America <laughs> over, over a, a man and a woman getting married. I mean, that's the way God ordained it. It's supposed to be that way. We're made different. We're built different. We think different. Why in the world would I want to wake up next to somebody that looks like me? I just don't. That's not right. There's something, there's just something unnatural about that, you know. And, uh, and, and I can't say this on YouTube, but Jerry Falwell said dogs don't even do it. Yeah, and I can't say that, so... Just wanted you to know I couldn't say it. <laughs> There's something perplexing going on in this country. Amen. It's perplexing. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm confused and bewildered. That's what perplexed means, just to be confused and bewildered. Why? why here, here's what Habakkuk was perplexed over. Why in the world does God allow all of the sin and devastation to go unchecked. Well, why is he allowing it to go on? Now the Bible says in, in the book of Habakkuk, chapter number 1, verse number 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. And then if you'll notice verse 3, Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me, and thou are that raise up strife and contention. Look at verse 9. They shall come for all for violence, their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And then if you'll, and I'm just picking out some verses here, you read all of it, but look at verse 13. Thou, Habakkuk saying to God, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously. Why in the world are you letting this thing go on like it is? That's what Habakkuk was saying to God. And holdest thy tongue, and he's saying, God, why are, why are you not doing anything? Why are you holding your tongue? Uh, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Why are you letting these ungodly people destroy the godly? Why, why are you letting this go on like it is? Well, you see that, you, you see how perplexed he is. And you look around at situations today, and, and if you're not careful, you'll get in the same shape of Habakkuk's in. You'll say, why in the world is all of this going on? Why does the whole world have to suffer while ungodly men plunge us deeper and deeper 
into ruin. When is God going to change the tide and cause justice to reign on the earth? You see, the silence of God to Habakkuk was very difficult to understand. Now, of course, we find the answers in this little book of Habakkuk. Um, someone, someone asked me up in Tennessee several years ago, the same question, why in the world does God let things go on? Why does God permit things to go on? And this particular person was searching for God, and they concluded that there must be no God. Because the God I keep hearing about is a loving, kind God. Well, let me tell you, He is loving, and He is kind, and you're a result of Him being long-suffering. We're a result of him being long-suffering. He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. It's only by the grace of God and the mercy of God that you and I aren't burning in hell today because all of us are sinners and come short of the glory of God. So I know that. But this particular person, there was some bad things that happened in their life. And automatically I went to Romans chapter 8. When they spoke of me, the Bible says, when they spoke of this to me of that particular subject... In Romans chapter number 8, listen to this. The Bible said in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. Now I've got that underlined in my Bible. That's my answer. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. <coughs> God's not responsible for that little baby being thrown in a dumpster right. or, or for that little baby being born that we've been praying for with a heart defect. God's not responsible for that. God's not responsible for the, for the daddy that's a drunkard and, and, and neglects his family and lets them go hungry. God's not responsible for that. But, but the Bible says in, in, in Genesis chapter number 3, when Adam plunged the whole human race into sin, what did that do to the human race and even to creation according to Romans 8? It, it started spiraling downward to, for destruction. And we're part of that spiraling downward, but we're subjected, the Bible says, in verse number uh, 20, to vanity, not willing, willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Let me tell you something. This thing is going to get worse because of man, but God said, I'm going to make it better. I'm, I'm going to make it better. And so the sin in this world is not God's creation. The sin is the man's creation, the devil's creation, and man's creation. Man is a sinner, but we're, we have the opportunity, of course, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we're promised that blessed hope. Well, anyway, that was the answer, and it seemed to help, and as a result, I don't know if they ever got saved, but I do know this, that that person I gave that answer to out of Romans chapter number 8 continued coming to the house of God, getting truth, and, and hopefully applying that truth, and got saved eventually. I hope so. Um, uh, anyway, uh, back in the book of Habakkuk, back in the book of Habakkuk, the times were, were pretty, pretty critical uh, the, pro the prophet Habakkuk had witnessed the revival under the good king of Josiah. If there ever was a good king recorded in the word of God, you'll find it in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 of King Josiah. The Bible said right in the beginning in verse 2 of 2 Chronicles chapter 34 that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. I encourage you as you read your Bible and you look at the kings, every time that it says that they walked in the ways of David their father, you can mark it down, they were an excellent king. And when it says they walked not in the ways of David their father, then you can find out they were a bad king. And that's the same way with leadership today. We have good presidents, we have bad presidents. Now, we're to pray for all of our presidents, pray for those in authority, but uh, just because they're in the office doesn't make them right. Amen? And so Josiah did that which was right. And the Bible said in verse 3 of 2 Chronicles chapter number 34 that he began to seek after the God of David his father. I, 
Everywhere in Scripture you find a man seeking after God, he found him. Not one time will you ever find anyone that began to seek God that did not find him and find the answers they needed. The answers to the perplexities of life and the problems of life can always be found in the Word of God. When you seek those answers, I promise you, with the right motive, with the right heart, the right mind, you're going to find the answer that you need to carry on. Well, the Bible said concerning Josiah uh, that it all, uh, actually it all started when he began to seek God. He did that which was right. But then he found the book there in verse number 18, which is the Word of God. Uh, and Shaphan read, read this book before the king, and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. Why did he rent his clothes? Because the Word of God is a mirror. It shows our blemishes. Josiah said, we've been doing this thing wrong. We've been doing this thing wrong, and I can see why all of the troubles and the trials and the perplexities have come as we've been doing this thing wrong. So let's follow after the Word of God. There is no revival apart from the Word of God. So if you want revival personally, you better get in the Word of God. It's been mentioned in Sunday school this morning, the importance of reading the Word of God and not just reading it through in 60 days, but continue reading it all throughout the year. Now read, read the Word of God. I need the Word of God. It's, it's food. We, we, we need food to survive physically. You need food to survive spiritually. Food for your soul. And uh, nevertheless, they incorporated what they heard in the Word of God. And so going back to Habakkuk, Habakkuk witnessed this great, great revival that came over the land of Judah under the last good king, that is Josiah. And we understand before that was Manasseh and after that was a wicked king and it went, it went to pot. It went to pot. Uh, everything, Dr. Lee Robinson used to say, and you might not uh, uh, like everything he said, but he did say this. He said, everything, every, uh, everything rises on uh, rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls. And that's, that's true. If you look in the Word of God, we had a good king. We have a good president. Things get better. We have a bad president or bad uh, Congress, bad Senate. Everything gets worse. So what's our responsibility as people that say they know the truth, that believe the truth, is to uh, every opportunity you get, uh, search out that individual that's running, go to the polls and cast your vote. Uh, if, if, we're a, if we're a democracy here in the United States of America, which we are, then we still have the right uh, to, to put into office who we think is, uh, would do a better job. The problem is, is that we have a country, it looks like, that doesn't want what we want here at the Faith Baptist Church. And that's hard to swallow. That is hard to swallow. You th you'd think everybody would think like we do. I mean, they ought to anyway. Everybody ought to be, be a member of the Faith Baptist Church too in Milton, Florida. But they're not. And so we just keep praying. We just keep doing what we know to do is right. And we're seeing this world go plunge downward. And that, that, and that, that brings a lot of perplexity. Why is this thing spiraling downward when we want what's right? Well, that's Habakkuk's problem. Now, he had witnessed revival. He watched us... Fact is, the, the, the prophet Habakkuk watched Assyria crumble. Assyria is the one that came against the northern kingdom, Israel. And uh, he, he saw, Habakkuk saw Egypt and Babylon fighting to take place of Assyria. Assyria is the one that came in and, and took Israel, but they tried to take Judah and didn't, the southern kingdom. And so then we got Egypt and Babylon battling out now to see who's going to be the next world power. And... Uh, uh, Nevertheless, Habakkuk saw that it was Babylon that won out. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated the Egyptians and took the civilized world as his kingdom. And, that's the, and, and this, is a whole, this is just by way of, of, of introduction, but that's, just, uh, that's your first image in the book of Daniel as a kingdom. That's the times of the Gentiles when it started, just by way of information. Anyway, during Habakkuk's time, there was strife and there was lawlessness, that was the order of the day. <clears throat> if you'll notice in, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 1, the burden, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. The burden, uh, that was the order of the day. Righteous people were being oppressed. In chapter number 1, we've already read in verse number 2 and verse number 13, there was people living in open sin. Uh, chapter 2, 
Look at chapter 2, verse number 4 and 5. The Bible said, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he uh, transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desires as hell, and is, uh, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. So they were living in open sin. They, they, the righteous people were being oppressed. And then, according to chapter number 2, and verse number 18 and 19... Uh, 18 said, What profit the graven image that, that the maker thereof hath graven it? And so they had a problem in that day, in Habakkuk's day, of worshiping idols and so forth like that. You know, uh, so we see the times that Habakkuk was in was pretty, pretty uh, lawless times. Pretty lawless times. Now, looking at Habakkuk himself, Habakkuk was a strong man of faith. But the facts of life were just too much for Habakkuk and he could not get answers. He could not reconcile in his own mind. He could not reconcile a bad world with a great good God. Habakkuk was an honest searcher after truth who was willing to go directly to God for the answer. Now, I've got to stop right there and comment. Uh, Habakkuk was a good man. He, he, there's some things in his mind he couldn't reconcile, but there was one thing that he did do. He began to search. He was an honest searcher of God. You know, there's a lot of people, let me make an application here. There's a lot of people sitting in church houses and church buildings today that think... And I say this, and I want you to think about what I'm saying. They think they're going to heaven because they did something the preacher said or did something the, uh, the pre did something the preacher told them to do, or they think that because they've got baptized or because they're tithing or living a good life that God maybe one day, you just get that maybe, maybe one day will accept them. Well, when you, get, when you become honest with yourself and honest with the Holy God, the Bible says in the book of John, chapter number 5, I believe it's verse number 39, search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they, that is the scripture, they are they that testify of me. So we get in the word of God. We, we might not understand all the things going on, and we've heard preachers here lately, and we've heard since I've been to the Faith Baptist Church, We've heard some things that may be just a little different than what we're used to hearing traditionally growing up. Traditionally, we've heard all you have to do is come down and repeat something and you'll go to heaven. But we heard when we went to Faith Baptist Church that everything necessary for me to go to heaven has been done 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Jesus died for my sin. He reconciled the world. He made peace. And why don't I believe God? And God said he would impute to me the righteousness I needed to go to heaven. Why don't I just believe God? You see, and so maybe there's some questions in your mind. When you begin, uh, just like Habakkuk was an honest searcher, when you, when you get honest with yourself, begin to search after God, I promise you, based on the Word of God, not based on David Rowan or any other preacher sitting here, but based on the Word of God, that you will find Him. You'll find Him. You'll find the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> so here's Habakkuk willing to go directly to God for the answer. Now, if you'll notice back in chapter number one, and I told you I was going to look at an overview of the whole book, but back in chapter number one, uh, he's been crying to the Lord, and it seems like the Lord is doing nothing. You remember um, over in the book of Revelation chapter six, and I'm going back to Habakkuk chapter one, but let me, let me read this to you. Revelation chapter number six and verse number 10 there were some people that died during the tribulation uh, that had been martyred. They were in heaven. And this is what they said, even in heaven, in, in verse 10 of Revelation 6. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? When are you going to do this? When are you going to wipe them out, take them out? Take them out? Fix it up. And uh, the Bible said to these particular individuals, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest 
yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Did you know that all through the scripture the Bible always told Israel and the godly when the cup's filled, that's when I'm going in. When the cup of their transgressions is filled and their iniquities are filled, that's when I'm going in. Did you know he waited before he let Israel go into, the, into Canaan for the, the inhabitants of Canaan for their sins to be filled? He did. And so it's coming. It's coming. I guarantee it's coming. You say, well, it should already be there. Well, it's not. I mean, it's in the process, but... When he decides to come back according to Revelation 19 and destroy the wicked Gentile nations, I guarantee you this, it'll happen. It'll happen when it's supposed to happen. And so uh, back, back to the book of Habakkuk, we see the prophets protest. Again, why does God allow the wicked and lawless man of Judah to continue to go unpunished? Unpunished. Now... The, the prophet Habakkuk is jealous for God's glory. And the silence of God was really difficult to understand. I want you to notice God's first answer. God's first answer. In verse 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 1 was the prophet's protest. And we see God's first answer beginning in verse number 5 of chapter 1. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye shall not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess, to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. And they shall fly as an eagle that hasteth to eat. So we've got a wicked nation, Babylon, coming in. This is God's answer. How long are you going to let sin go unpunished? God said, I have you an answer. I'm going to use Babylon. God says that he's not inattentive. God said that he's not inactive and he's not indifferent. He tells the prophet to look beyond the borders of Israel that he is already working a work. You see, God had already enlisted the help of the Chaldeans. And by the way, God didn't have to ask their permission either. He had already enlisted the help of the Chaldeans in the work of chastening Judah. You see, the moral problem, though, according to verse number 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way through 17, was Habakkuk had complained of God's indifference. Up to this point, he said, God, you, you and the Lord knows I don't mean this, but he, he said, God, you must be indifferent. You're not listening. You're not doing a thing. Well, when God tells him what he's doing, now Habakkuk's horrified to hear the means that God's going to use in bringing judgment. Yeah. How could a pure, holy, righteous, perfect God use such a wicked people as Babylon to chasten the righteous? How could he do something like that? And so what he does, if you'll notice in verse number 13 of chapter 1, the Bible said, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Therefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth man that is more righteous than he. You know what Habakkuk's doing? He's challenging God to defend his actions. How in the world, now, you've told me how you're going to do this, but how can you do that? How can you use somebody so wicked to judge a righteous people? Well, now, let me, let me, let, let me add something right here. I'm not going to add something. I'm going to show you something else in the Bible. Um, there, there's a greater picture of that work that God does, which ye shall not believe, though it be told unto you. Now, the, the, the immediate picture is I'm already doing a work by stirring up the Chaldeans to come in and judge my people. But there's a greater picture. If you'll hold your place in Habakkuk and turn over to Acts chapter 13. 
Acts chapter 13. You need to see this, Acts chapter number 13. <clears throat> and we'll start reading up here in about verse 37. The Bible said in Acts 13 verse 37, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through what man, of course? The Lord Jesus Christ. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Did you know that because of Christ, God forgave the sins? We're forgiven for Christ's sake. Ephesians 4.32. We're forgiven. The Bible said he's a propitiation in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. For our sin, that is Christian sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Our sin has been dealt with in the person of Christ and by his shed blood. And so I'm preaching to you to receive this forgiveness. You need to receive it. I'm not asking you to ask God to forgive you of your sins. He's already took, taken care of your sins. What you need to do is receive that forgiveness. You say, what's the difference? There's a big difference. I can't ask God to come back down and die again and shed his blood again, but I can believe that he did shed his blood from the remission of sins. You see the difference? It's already done. All right, now, verse number uh, 39. And by him all that believe are justified from what? All that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, I sure love that. I sure love that verse. By him all that believe are justified. Not to all that repeat a set of words, not to all that get baptized with water, not to all that uh, tithe every week, but the Bible said to all that believe. Or and what does justified mean? Just as if I never sinned, but it means to be declared righteous. Romans 3. I'm not going to get in that today, but Romans 3, it's declared righteous. Because you and I just don't look right. I'm looking at some of you that claim righteousness. You just don't look righteous. You say, preacher, you don't either. Well, that, that's not the message. The message is that when you believe, you're declared, you're justified. You're declared righteous. I am declared righteous, and one day, I'm going to look righteous. I'm going to get a glorified body and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 2. Amen? All right. So, anyway, the, where are we at? Verse number uh, 39, all that believe can know. Okay, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. Now, here it is. Habakkuk said this, didn't he? For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You see, now back over in the book of Habakkuk, chapter number 1, basically it said the same thing in verse number 5. We know the near view, the, the, near, the near Bible interpretation is that I'm, I'm working on Chaldee to come in and judge my people. But we know there's a far view right here as well. And what's going to happen? I'm going to work a work in your days which you will not believe. You know the Lord Jesus died on Calvary for your sin. I've said that over and over. He died for your sin. He was put in, the, in a grave and he rose again after three days and three nights for our justification. He is at the right hand of the Father as our sympathetic high priest today making intercession for you and I. Now, he's already done a work that people aren't believing. Amen. He has already made peace. He's already made reconciliation. He's already given man a way out. You say, well, this world's going to hell in a hand. Yes, it is, but I'm not part of it. Right. I'm in it, but not of it. Thank you. Are, you, are you listening? I'm in it, but not of it. Amen. And so Habakkuk, Habakkuk finally, I'm going to show you how he finally got a hold of that. How he finally got a hold of that. Um... So he, he made a protest. There was a moral problem that he couldn't understand why as holy as God was to use somebody as wicked as Chaldeans to judge his people. And he began to challenge God and defend, to defend his actions. And then we see in chapter number 2, verse number 1, 
Habakkuk made a very important decision. I'm, I'm winding down here. The Bible said in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, I had to laugh at this verse. You, you say, you're laughing at the word of God. No, I'm, loving, I'm loving Habakkuk's... I'm loving his, his, his honesty. He said, I, he said I, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging God to justify himself, so I'm just going to sit here and wait till he zaps me. I'm going to wait till I'm reproved. I know he's going to reprove me, but I don't know how yet. And you, you're getting that? I just thought that was pretty good. You ever done something, you really can't understand it, you're perplexed, and you begin to ask God and say, well, I know it's coming. I know it's coming unless he shows me so I can go ahead and repent and get everything taken care of. But it's coming. He's going to show me one way or the other. So he's going to reprove me. And, uh, and the Lord answered me in verse number 2 of chapter 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now, he made an important decision. The prophet finds a solution only when he obediently takes his place on the watchtower to wait for the Lord God. And that's a good lesson for us, you know. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God's second answer, beginning in verse number 2, 3, and 4, um, God knows the wickedness of the Chaldeans, and he knows that their time is coming, yet he tells Habakkuk to write the vision and write it legible so that it can be read over and over and over. It should be a lesson to generations to come. Now that verse right there that says, Make it plain upon thy tables, upon tables that he may run that readeth it, that's either write it in such a print that it can be read very quickly and very legible. Or I think there's a, there's a, a good application that you need to act upon truth quickly right here as well. You need to act upon truth quick. Wow, what's coming? He's supposed to write that Babylon is coming to chasten Judah. And if I look in the scripture, I understand according to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, that God said he would not have us to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, as you saw or not, uh, like them that have no hope, and I'm paraphrasing, that we need to believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. We need, he's coming, and I guarantee you he's coming back. Whether you believe it or not, he's coming back. And he's coming back every time there was a great event before a judgment, before the flood, before anything, God, God took his people out. And that's exactly what's going to happen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you're not a part of that, then you're going to have to face and go through the working of the beast or man. And, and you're going to subject yourself and your family to taking the mark of the beast unless you get saved and possibly even kill uh, for Christ's sake, according to Revelation chapter 10. And, and on. Now, I could go into that, but I'm not. But I guarantee you this. This is what I'm telling you. It's coming. Whether you believe it or not, it's coming. Judgment is coming. Write it. Write it legible. Write it so that people can read it. They could even read it while they're running. Read it. We have it written legible, uh, uh, salvation in Christ and Christ alone. We have uh, uh, already written in the word of God that he's going to come back one day when the times are, when the cup is filled and the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In Revelation 19, he's coming back with his saints and he's going to destroy with the word of his mouth the wicked, all of the lost, and the blood is going to run high as the horse's bridles. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming. So why don't you believe Christ while it's today? While it's today. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Write the vision. Write it legible so that it can be read over and over and over and over. Well, and I see, I see the clock. I've probably got another 30 minutes with the woes in Habakkuk. Maybe we'll go through that again. But uh, in chapter 3 and uh, first, and actually uh, all of chapter 3, verse number 1 through 19, um, 
there's an anthem of praise that Habakkuk begins to say, begins to, uh, to come out with. And Habakkuk comes to realize, here's what, he, here, here's what he comes to realize, that he can trust implicitly in Almighty God. That's what he learned. And I thought, well, what a fitting ending. He's questioning God. He's worried. He's perplexed. But in chapter number 3, he said, I see it. <laughs> I see it. I can rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that God's going to fix it all one day in his time. Amen. The question is, are you fixed today? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Let's stand to our feet, please. Brother Dave, if you'll get us a song, please. Miss King, if you'll come. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us and we love you so much. We thank you, dear Lord, for the answers of life, all the issues of life. We thank you. All we have to do is read it in the Word of God. You've written it legibly, dear God. You've given us your Word. You've given us your Holy Spirit to help us understand it. And I pray, Lord, that today decisions will be made concerning the Lord. Those that uh, maybe like Habakkuk just don't understand everything going on. Lord, help us to learn this, that we can trust implicitly in God Almighty. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.